20 years ago, Ontario changed the way it funds education. Now, despite more than $25 billion in annual spending on education, declining enrollment in many places means funding for local schools just isn't adding up. That's got students and parents upset in many parts of the province, especially when their local school is on the chopping block. Mitzi Hunter is Ontario's Minister of Education and the Liberal MPP for Scarborough Guildwood, and she joins us now for more on the state of spending on Ontario schools. Welcome to TVO. Thank you for having me here. Nice to have you back here. Yes. Okay, let's um, just get a snapshot of what enrollment in the province looks like. Sheldon, if you would, bring up this graphic here. We're going back a few years here. In 2011-2012, in that school year, there were more than 2 million students enrolled in publicly funded schools in the province of Ontario. But fast forward to 2015, and that number drops by nearly 40,000 students. Yes, enrollment is declining. Let's start from scratch here. How are schools in the province of Ontario funded to begin with? Well, Steve, you know, this is uh, an incredible story in Ontario in terms of Ontario's publicly funded education system. We have one of the best education systems in the world. If you look at any measure in the OECD, we're always at the top quartile and focusing on core things like reading, writing, and math. I know all that, but tell me how they're funded. So, this is reflective of the investments that we have made in education. The funding for Ontario's education system since 2003 is up by 59%. And when you look at the funding formula, we are not only funding on a per pupil basis, which recognizes fluctuations that are quite normal over time, but we also have increased funding for schools that are not related to per pupil. Minister, appreciate all that, but let's just First principles here, schools are funded how? Entirely by you, some off the property tax base, how does it work? So schools are funded, that's one of the, the beauties of our education system in Ontario in terms of equitable funding for education. They are funded through the province. Province right? of Ontario. So the province days of, of the Ontario. Pro the, the municipalities are out of funding education. Yeah. That's, that was 20 years ago and Mike Sorry. Harris was responsible for all that. How much of the funding today is tied to the number of students per school? So we've actually um, changed the funding formula. We've moved away from funding on a per pupil basis because we recognize that school boards um, have other considerations that they need to make. So we've actually moved to fund a third of the portion of school funding is not based on per pupil. So if you have a bit of a low enrollment, your numbers are a bit down, you are able to somewhat compensate for you're, that? You're able to uh, maintain uh, a quality program in schools. We want school boards to focus on the quality of their programming so that we can get the best outcomes for students. And that's why we've changed the funding formula. Because we want to recognize that there are differences. There are geographic differences, um, there are linguistic differences, and therefore school boards will require those, those fundings to remain stable. Any sense about what percentage of the schools or the boards in the province get that kind of top-up funding? Well, in fact, um, we are now funding um, a, th a third of the, the grants for student needs is actually not based on a per pupil basis. A third? A third. That's pretty significant. And it's up, actually. It used to be 25%. It's now a third. So despite the fact that uh, enrollments have changed and they've, they have declined, as you've acknowledged, we've actually maintained a higher level of funding that's do, going into good programming for students. Do you intend to phase out that top-up funding? Well, you know, we're, we are constantly looking at the GSN. Um, it's reviewed GSN? on the Grants for Student Needs. Okay. It's reviewed on an annualized basis. And we're, in fact, investing more in student programming, not less. Okay, but have you decided to phase out that top-up? Well, we are going to be making changes. There was a short-term um, top-up that we had for school boards to access who had excess space and they needed to continue to, to fund the overall, just keeping the lights on. So we've said to school boards, you know, look at how you can create those types of efficiencies and ensure that the funding is going into the programming for the students. And how many boards would have excess space by your definition? I would say uh, the, the majority of boards uh, would be looking at uh, some sort of space configuration. Fluctuations in student population is not new. It's always been a factor. So we want to ensure that boards are using uh, those resources that we're putting into the schools as efficiently as possible. Fair to say that, that therefore some schools in rural Ontario are not going to get the top up they once did. 
You know, we're actually particularly sensitive to the needs uh, of schools in rural um, Ontario. On, on average, uh, students in rural Ontario get about $1,100 more per pupil than students in urban centres. So we recognize that because there are differences in providing an education in rural communities. Um, there are needs for, um, based on geography, increased transportation. Uh, there are just factors that affect uh, the delivery of programming in rural centers, so we provide additional funding that recognizes that. I understand, $1,100, but is that $1,100 going to start to shrink? It's actually, um, so since uh, in the year 2016-17 school year, we are providing $3.7 billion to rural schools, and that is an increase in 2013 of $200 million. But this government says it, it, it intends to balance the next budget which, when it comes out in the spring, and I presume the Ministry of Education is going to be asked to make a contribution to making sure that happens. So where in education funding are the numbers going to start to shrink in order to ensure that the budget's balanced? The good news about Ontario's education system is that not only have we maintained the level of funding, we've actually increased it. So if you look at just in the last year alone, $300 million in addition has been added to Ontario's education budget, despite the fact that enrollments have gone down. Let's also understand this. You know, people all over the province are reading in their newspapers that various schools are on the chopping block because of declining enrollment and a variety of other factors. Are those your decisions? You know, what, what's great is that uh, Ontario's system of education has a strong local focus through the school boards. And, um, and it's the responsibility of local school boards to make decisions that affect their local schools. People don't want decisions about their local schools being made at Queen's Park. So when they see in the paper that, you know, PS number 25 is about to shut down, that's not because Mitzi Hunter has decided to close it. That's a decision that is made by the local board. We, what we've done is that we've put in a process so that there is a transparent and open consultation that has to be done by school boards if they're considering closing a school. How does that process go? So the pupil, accommodate, the pupil accommodation review po uh, process allows school boards to consult, to get meaningful input from the community. They have to consult with local municipalities, community organization, and of course, parents and students. They have to hold at least two public meetings in order to uh, make that decision ultimately that the board will make to close a school. And if a board in its wisdom decides at the end of the day after having gone through that consultation and heard what people have to say, if they decide that, you know, again, PS25 has to close or PS25 and 26 have to merge in order to realize savings, who keeps the savings? Those savings are really put back into the programming that's offered within that school board. So the board keeps the, the money. The board will keep that money. It doesn't go to you. It doesn't go to me okay. so that they can offer better programming. And oftentimes, boards are motivated to make changes to local schools because they have a desire to offer that better programming. They want to offer um, better uh, sports and recreation programs, maybe a better facilities in terms of just the, the physical space, building a new school, um, or offering those very important programs that uh, determine the outcome for students like specialist high skills majors that really link to 21st century learning. Okay, I want to play a clip here. This is Susan McKenzie, head of the Ontario Alliance Against School Closures. I don't have to tell you that there are some people who are not thrilled with the idea that the local school may have to close. This was at a news conference at Queen's Park last November. Sheldon, roll it please. These are not reviews to engage the community and the municipality. These are predetermined closures. A vicious cycle has evolved where no elected body wants to be accountable. One in eight schools is being considered for closure. This equates to 600 schools with the majority in rural Ontario. One could argue that it would be more fiscally responsible to maintain the top-up funding than to maintain abandoned properties this government will bestow upon our school boards. You know that your critics are saying that a disproportionate number of rural schools are going to be closed because the Liberals have no seats in rural Ontario or next to no seats in rural Ontario. True or false? That's false. My responsibility as Minister of Education is to the students of this province to ensure that they get the best education possible. That doesn't mean that we don't have tough decisions to make. And I know that when a board has to think about the closure of a school or any change, 
that that's a very difficult decision for that board and for that local community. The reason we have this accommodation review process is that that dialogue needs to occur on a local level. One of the things though, I mean if you close a school in Toronto or in Ottawa or in Hamilton or something like that, the next school is probably five, ten minutes away. We are hearing stories in rural Ontario where when the local school closes, there are students who are therefore being bused, you know, a total of a, a, you know, an hour and a half or two hours over the course of the day to and from. Is that acceptable to you? It's, you know, it's not acceptable to me to have those unreasonable numbers that people are talking about because I know that we've put guidelines in place so that, for instance, um, when a board has to think about a school closure, that the decision cannot be made that puts students um, at that type of uh, undue um, effort. So we have a, a minimum standard of 20 kilometers away for the next closest high school and, tw and 10 kilometers for the next closest elementary school within that school board. So would you and intervene in a situation where a student had to commute two hours uh, to get to school and back? It's, it's you know, it, it's ultimately, it's still a decision that this local board will have to make, but they have a, a set of guidelines that we've put in place in order to make that decision. I want to tell you about an elementary school that we heard about in Markdale, Ontario. That's Gray County up near Georgian Bay. One of the places is slated to close, and apparently a company called Chapman's Ice Cream offered to buy it because they are concerned about the impact it could have not only on the growth of their business, but also if there's no local school, people aren't going to move into that town, you know, people with young families. Are the social and economic impacts of school closures taken into account by the appropriate authorities? And it's actually for that very reason why our accommodation review guideline includes input from municipalities that have the opportunity to talk about the economic impact, to talk about the role of that school. We know, I know, that schools are at the heart of a community and that they play an incredibly important role. So when school boards have to make that local decision in terms of where to locate those schools, if a change has to be made, they have to consider all of those factors. I appreciate that, but you, you know, we, I've seen this over uh, three and a half decades of watching this issue. If local authorities make decisions that the Ministry of Education thinks are not the right decisions, the Ministry can and often does intervene. And I think people in Ontario, particularly in rural, want to know, will you do that if you think they are missing the boat? You know, just um, last week, I was out uh, in uh, in rural Ontario. Is actually in eastern Ontario, and uh, and I visited three high schools and an elementary school, and uh, and saw the the passion of our educators who are teaching our students and providing the best possible programming for our students. And you know, my my perspective as Minister of Education is that our locally ex elected school boards are there to provide um, the best programming possible for students in their community. So it sounds like a no. It sounds well, like a no, I'm not going to intervene. What I want to do is to ensure that they have the right sets of tools. We've provided um, additional resources and supports for school boards because we know that the decisions that they have to make are very difficult. Some of these decisions are not being made because of money and resources. They're being made because the board understands that they must provide better programming for students. The Ontario Alliance Against School Closures has called for a moratorium on school closures so a new guide can be developed. Would you consider that? You know, I'm not going to make arbitrary decisions uh, about school closures. I, I believe that the school boards are making those, those tough decisions. I was just uh, actually in Peterborough in October announcing um, a consolidation of two schools coming together to build one new, brand new elementary school. They're making that decision because they want to provide better programming for those students. Uh, can I open up a can of worms here with you now? Let's do it, shall we? Let's do it. Uh, when people knew that you were coming on this program, many of them were all over Twitter telling me to ask the following question. So I'm going to do that because the question essentially was, why are we going to close schools over a lack of potential funding to keep them open when, for example, we could save hundreds of millions of dollars, they argue, uh, in unnecessary duplication and waste and administration if we would move to a single unified school system rather than have a publicly funded secular school system, a publicly funded Catholic school system, a publicly funded French school system. Is that something you'd consider? 
Steve, I'm not going to go there. You know, we, we they want you to go there. We, well, we have a system of education in Ontario. We have four systems that are working well and delivering a quality education on behalf of students in Ontario. 95% of students in Ontario attend our publicly funded education system. It's one of the best systems in the world that's delivering the results that parents would expect on behalf of students. So I'm not going to, um, you know, step away from our constitutional obligations at this stage. What we're focused on is providing the best education for students. I hear you. Two other provinces had those constitutional obligations and decided after a hundred and however many years that uh, it was a different time and therefore they had either referendums or passed laws uh, basically changing their constitutional obligations. Is that something Ontario would consider? It's not something that we're considering. We're very committed to the system of education that we have, continuing to invest in that system of education, and that includes all four systems. Are you concerned that there's too much waste and duplication in those four systems, and if, if they did come together, you could save enough money to keep a lot of these schools open? We have so many good examples of those boards coming together. I was just in Hamilton where the French Catholic and the French Public Board are coming together to form a brand new high school for students. So boards are working together and, and I, that's an expectation I have of them. I tell them that as I go out and I talk to school boards and, uh, and meet with educators. It's important that they work together, whether it's uh, sharing space, maybe coordinating on transportation, back office services. So there is an opportunity to create those efficiencies without stepping away from our constitutional obligation. In our last 30 seconds here then, would you give some advice to parents, to students around Ontario who may be about to lose their local school. What do you suggest they do? You know, and, and I've gone out to communities and I've seen the engagement of parents and students um, in their schools. We're all uh, connected to schools. It's, uh, it's at the heart of our communities. And I want parents to know, I want students to know that their voice matters. And that's why we have an accommodation review process in place, that they can give that meaningful input directly to the local school board and that they listen to that input and make the best decision possible. I want to correct one thing that uh, was played mm -hmm. on the clip with Susan. Even though there there are 600 uh, schools that are being reviewed, it doesn't mean that those 600 schools are closing. It means that they're being looked at so that a local board can make the best decision to provide good programming for students. We're also opening schools. We've opened 760 new schools here in Ontario, as well as expanded 735 uh, uh, ex expansions in schools, $14 billion of infrastructure investment in school capital. Okay, I'm over time here, but, but since you've raised that, it makes me wonder, how come it's a local board's decision to shut a school, but it's the province's decision to build and, and open and cut the ribbon and get the publicity on the creation of a new school? We do that together. The province's responsibility, my responsibility as minister, is to provide those resources in communities, but the priority decision of where to open a school, that is brought forward by the local board. Gotcha. That's Mitzi Hunter, Minister of Education, MPP scarborough Guildwood. Thanks for visiting us at TVO tonight. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.